through our 19th annual Weisberg Chair in Human Rights Address. Tonight, we're particularly honored to be joined by our new friend and current Weisberg Chairholder, Joel Simon. Joel is recognized by his peers and his readers as an exemplar for his work as a journalist and an author, one of the most important spokespersons in the world for the freedom of the press, and has led efforts around the world to better ensure the protection and safety of journalists. As the weather warms up and the days get longer, my thoughts begin to turn towards commencement. Last year, a few days before commencement, I was enjoying dinner at her house with a small group of soon-to-be graduates, and they were beginning to get a little nostalgic, and one of them said, I cannot imagine what next year will be like without Weisberg Week. And that prompted a second student to say, oh, Weisberg Week. I just loved every one. We look forward to it all year. The next 30 minutes was filled, were filled with specific memories of specific predecessors to you, Mr. Simon. Weisberg Week matters. And it doesn't happen by accident. It starts with the college's mission, whose glorious first sentence reads, Beloit College engages the intelligence imagination and curiosity of its students, empowering them to lead fulfilling lives marked by high achievement, personal responsibility, and public contribution in a diverse society. A mission which is wonderfully found and purchased in the support of the Weisberg Foundation, who proudly proclaim that they envision, quote, a just world that recognizes inequities and builds access, opportunity, and power so that all can thrive. It may then not be all that surprising that one of the principals of the Weisberg Foundation, Nina Weisberg, is a graduate of the oldest and finest college in Wisconsin. I wonder if you would take a moment to recognize the members of the Weisberg Foundation who are here with us today, including Nina Weisberg, Floyd graduate. Thank you very, very much. But it takes two to tango the magic of the Weisberg Week starts with an inspirational chair. Mr. Simon, that is you. But it must also include an engaged community. Among the things I love about Weisberg Week are the previous weeks and months of preparation that so many members of the community take so seriously so that we are ready to take full advantage of the time we have with you, Mr. Simon. The Boyd College community recognizes an opportunity when it knocks. It is one of our most remarkable qualities. These weeks and months of preparation require extraordinary leadership and vision on the ground, on this campus. There are three members of our community that I want to recognize who work tirelessly, brilliantly, creatively, and generously to make this week possible each year. First, our Manter family, Professor of International Relations, Beth Dockerday. Established a journalist assistance program, 
and spearhead CPJ's defense of press freedom in the digital space through the creation of a dedicated technology program. He has participated in CPG missions around the world from Argentina to Zimbabwe. Under his leadership, CPJ has been honored with the Thomas J. Dodd Prize in International Justice and Human Rights and a news and documentary Emory for its work in defense of press freedom. In 2018, it won the Chatham House Award, which is awarded to the person or to the organization that has made the most significant contribution to the improvement of international relations in the previous year. Simon has written widely on press freedom issues for publications including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and he is a regular contributor to the Columbia Journalism Review. Prior to joining CBJ in 1997 as the America's Program Coordinator, Simon worked for a decade as a freelance journalist in Latin America. He covered the Guatemalan Civil War, the Zapatista Uprising in Southern Mexico, the debate over the North American Free Trade Agreement, and the economic turmoil in Cuba following the collapse of the Soviet Union. A graduate of Amherst College and Stanford University, he is the author of three books, Endangered Mexico, An Environment on the Edge, the new censorship inside the global battle for media freedom, and his most recent book, which was literally just released, We Want to Negotiate, The Secret World of Kidnapping, Hostages, and Ransom. Please join me um, in uh, welcoming Joel Simon.
1980, Gonzalez del Valle was visiting the United States as part of a State Department program when he got word that he would be arrested as soon as he returned home. One journalist, Lori Nadell, was a producer with CBS News, and she learned about this, and she decided she wanted to help. She called her friend Michael Massey, who was the executive editor of the Columbia Journalism Review, and he in turn called U.S. journalists uh, in Latin America, and he alerted them to Gonzalez del Valle's predicament. Not long after Gonzalez del Valle returned to Paraguay, he was hauled away and, and arrested. The network that Massing had mobilized swung into action. The New York Times ran a story on the arrest, and so did international news agencies. Strasser didn't back down immediately, but the negative media attention did take a toll. Gonzalez del Valle was released after 70 days. He went right back to writing his critical From that case, a model was born. If the might of the U.S. media could be harnessed for a specific political purpose, to defend the rights of vulnerable journalists around the world, well, maybe the bad guys would think twice. Nadell and Madison sought to create an institutionalized structure that would respond whenever journalists came under attack. They needed a figure at head. Who better than Walter Cronkite? Now, for those of you who grew up in the internet age, which is everyone at the school, um, it's hard to explain what Cronkite's position was in American life. He was a figure of immense stature and influence, but also integrity. He was the dean of the nightly news anchors, and he also had a history of fighting for press freedom. He had led efforts to locate journalists who had gone missing in Vietnam and Cambodia. Nadell was able to reach Cronkite through the CBS inter-office mail. To her surprise, he agreed to serve as the honorary chair of the fledgling committee, although he acknowledged he could not devote much personal time to the organization. Still, his name on the letterhead sent a message that U.S. journalists were willing to step outside their traditional role and stand up for the rights of their colleagues around the world. With Cronkite on board, CPJ was off and running. Massey and Nadell sought to recruit a board of leading American journalists. Among them were Tony Lewis, the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, and a leading First Amendment expert, Jay Kramer, who covered Europe for the New Yorker, Dan Rather, then a CBS correspondent, Charlene hunter Galt, who was a national correspondent for uh, what, be, what would later become the PBS NewsHour, Peter Arnett, who had covered uh, the Vietnam War for the Associated Press, and of course would later have a long career at CNN. <laughs> In a media interview, Arnett explained that CPJ would, quote, gather and disseminate information about the plight of American and local reporters in foreign nations that are systematically abusing press rights. We, CPJ, want to be the link between journalists and human rights concerns where it involves the abuse of reporters. At the beginning, CPJ was a little more than its letterhead. Sometimes that was enough. In 1982, a team of British journalists were detained while covering the Falkland War in Argentina. Brief refresher for those of you who don't remember the Falkland War. Argentina had long claimed these islands off the coast, uh, off its coast as part of its territory, and then in the waiting days of the dictatorship of Argentina, it seized them by force. The British subsequently seized them back. So after these British journalists were arrested, CPJ sent a letter of protest signed by none other than Walt Cronkite. The journalists were subsequently released. In its early years, CPJ also sent delegations of leading American journalists to visit places where press freedom was under threat, including Central America and South Africa. These delegations were able to use the power of the U.S. media to secure visas, gain meetings with senior officials, and amplify the concerns of local journalists who could not speak out publicly without risking their lives. In South Africa, the CPJ team raised concerns about the banning of journalists under, an apartheid, under apartheid era laws. In Central America, they focused on enforced disappearances of journalists by government despots. RDA Nair, Another one of CPJ's founding board members was also the founder of the organization that would later become Human Rights Watch. Arie believed that in order for the broader human rights movement to be successful, 
It needed a press. It needed American journals who were willing to cover human rights issues, and I believe that the best way to, set, to sensitize journalists to those issues was to get them to focus on threats to their journalistic colleagues. By defending press freedom in places where human rights violations were taking place, Nair believed that CPJ could create space for journalists to report on broader human rights concerns in their own countries. The human rights movement and the press freedom movement were thus inextricably linked from the beginning. It's important to understand that this strategy of mobilizing the media worked because of the media structure at the time. The media was dominated by a relatively small number of outlets which exerted outside influence over all areas of American life. As President Lyndon Johnson once put it in relation to the Vietnam War, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. Now, this was not entirely a good thing because the media served as gatekeepers and because they tended to see the world from the same perspective, many critical voices and ideas were excluded from the public debate. But it did mean that a single op-ed in the New York Times or a segment on 60 Minutes could take over the national conversation and in many instances change government policies. The US also had tremendous influence in terms of global norm setting, not to mention unrivaled political and economic power. Part of the human rights agenda was to convince the US policymaking establishment that the defense of human rights could advance US strategic interests abroad, and that when the US failed to uphold those human rights standards, it undermined those interests. Of course, such efforts were not always successful, but the media was a central tool to harness the hypocrisy and expose it, the so-called name and shame strategy. When this was done successfully, US policy could shift overnight. The 1990s saw an explosion in press freedom worldwide. The collapse of the Soviet Union not only liberated journalists working behind the Iron Curtain, it also represented the demise of a political system that provided ideological justification for state censorship. At the heart of the Soviet system, in fact, was a system, was the control of information. That was until Mikhail Gorbachev opened the door for Glasnost in the belief that more open media would make the Soviet people allies in his program of economic liberalization. This is what he said. The better informed the people are, the more intelligently they act, and the more actively they support the party and its programmatic goals. It didn't quite work out that way. The Russian media was about the only institution to thrive in the post-Soviet chaos. Of course, more open media also took root in the newly liberated countries of Eastern Europe. But trouble was brewing. The Bosnian War became the first ethnic nationalist conflict of the post-Cold War era. It was not surprising that journalists were victims in that conflict, but it was deeply unsettling that they were deliberately targeted. For decades, journalists covering conflict had believed that their neutrality their willingness to talk to all sides kept them safe. They were so secure in this belief that they sought to identify themselves as members of the press by taping the letters TV on their flat jackets and their vehicles. Then, in August 1992, a sniper shot and killed ABC producer David Kaplan as he drove in a convoy of vehicles through Sarajevo. The bullet passed between the T and the B emblazoned on his vehicle. It was the end of journalistic community and a harbinger of much worse to come. That's me, with a lot more hair. <laughs> At the time this was happening, I was beginning my journalism career as a freelance writer based in Mexico City. I covered a number of major international stories the devaluation of the Mexican peso, the rise of the insurgent group known as the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, the assassination of presidential candidate Luis Donaldo Colosio, the so-called special period in Cuba triggered by the Soviet collapse. Let me tell you a little bit about how the media worked in those days. Because there was no real internet, one of the advantages I had being based in Mexico City 
was my access to the Mexican media. Every day, I would buy five or six newspapers, and I just spent hours reading them carefully. Then, I would clip the articles and sort them into files so that if a story broke, I could access all the relevant background information immediately. I also knew many Mexican journalists and I would invite them out for drinks so that they could keep me updated on the latest political developments. If I visited a small town, I would look up the local journalists and download them on the most important events. In effect, I was a human search engine. I had another advantage as an international journalist, even a scruffy freelancer. Even though Mexico was a fairly dangerous place for the press, I felt reasonably safe. Of course, I did not see it this way at the time, but it was the enduring power of the media as an institution that gave me this protection. <clears throat> because of my reliance on, Me on Mexican journalists to do my work as an international correspondent in Mexico, I really felt I was in their debt. So when an opportunity presented itself to take the job as the America's Program Coordinator for the Committee to Protect Journalists, I jumped. From my base in New York, my job was to document press freedom violations committed against journalists in Latin America and to defend the rights of colleagues in the region seeking to bring us the news. One of the first cases I confronted was in Peru. In 1990, Alberto Fujimori was elected as the president of Peru. He assumed that role as an outsider and a technocrat. He had no political party, and while he was born in Peru, he spoke Spanish with a Japanese accent. After an era defined by civil conflict, corruption, and hyperinflation, Fukimori promised Peru a new beginning. Then, in 1992, in what was dubbed the self coup, he dissolved Congress and assumed near absolute power. The shadowy intelligence chief, Vladimir Montesinos, waged an unprecedented war on the media, using everything from bribes to sex tapes to legal prosecution to undermine the media's independent role. At CPJ, we helped lead an international campaign in support of Peruvian journalists. We led a high-level delegation to meet with the president. We supported international litigation, and we mobilized the global media. Detailed coverage, coverage and strong editorials forced a shift in US policy, which helped isolate Fukimori. In 2001, while traveling to Japan on official business, Fukimori faxed his letter of resignation back to Lima. Fukimori was later tried and convicted on human rights charges. While CPJ's traditional model of advocacy, mobilize, mobilizing um, the media in support of press freedom, worked in Peru, new technologies were beginning to upend media structures. First, much of the work that I had done as a foreign correspondent, i.e. reading the local media, could now be done from a desk anywhere in the world. You might need some local language ability, no Google Translate yet, uh, and to know the names of local publications since search was really primitive, but you could find out what was going on. One thing I should know that was that as a freelancer, I made my living reselling the same story multiple times, to newspapers in different markets, i.e. the Chicago Tribune, which I used to write for, and the San Francisco Chronicle. That strategy worked because they weren't competing with one another, but in the internet era, it was off the table. In fact, smaller market news organizations saw fewer reasons to feel international correspondence since those looking for international news would simply go to the websites of major news organizations like the New York Times. This was convenient since technology was also disrupting the business model that had sustained news organizations in the post-war era. Classified advertising, the lifeblood of most local newspapers, moved online to specialized websites like Craigslist. Subscriptions began to plummet. Display advertising also began to move online. As news organizations began to cut costs, they targeted expensive beats like farm bureaus, investigative reporting, and Washington Correspondents, which were precisely the journalists that CPJ and other human rights groups would target as an essential component of our advocacy. Another thing began to happen as well, although this process took longer. News organizations became less objective 
and began to more closely align with the political identity of their readers. It turns out that objectivity was a marketing strategy developed to maximize readership in a captive local market. To explain this more crudely, the New York Times went from being a metropolitan newspaper that sought to appeal to everyone in New York to a global website that sought to appeal to readers around the world. As a local newspaper, alienating conservatives, alienating conservatives in New York was bad for business. As a global website, not so much. This transformation of the global information ecosystem was certainly not all bad news. Information was liberated, and powerful forms of new media emerged. But as the media fractured and polarized in the US and around the world, the power dynamic shifted, which had far-ranging implications for individual journalists, for press freedom, and for global advocacy. The transformation of the global media system posed challenges to a new generation of autocrats who sought to control the information space. The collapse of communism had stripped away the ideological just rationale that justified censorship. So these leaders sought to hide their repression behind a democratic veneer. I call them the democratators. Here are three of the leading examples. Vladimir Putin, Hugo Chavez, and Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Obviously, they do not share an ideology. They share a strategy. All three sought to use the legitimacy they derived from winning elections to curtail independent institutions that could constrain their power, most notably the press. All three used regulatory pressure, punitive tax laws, hostile takeovers, and selective repression to wrest control of critical media organizations and place them in the hands of loyal allies. All three denounced their national media with some justification as beholden to oligarchic interests and failing to serve the public. The democratic strategy has been embraced by a host of other leaders, from Hungary's Viktor Orban, to Uhura Kenyatta in Kenya, to Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. Under the democratic system, information control is not absolute. Some independent media are tolerated. The rest is managed or repressed as required to, to, to retain power. The new strategy also transformed the threat landscape. Historically, according to Rand analyst David Bromfeld to coin the term network, the advantage conferred on a conventional military was less about their weaponry and more about their systems of communication, i.e., the military hierarchy allowed for the efficient dissemination of intelligence upwards and orders downwards through the ranks. Now, new information technologies were leveling the playing field, allowing diffuse networks to communicate freely and securely on, check this out, email. Yes, in the days before governments developed the capacity to track and surveil electronic communication, Al Qaeda militants planned their plan to organize their attacks. As for the Al-Qaeda media strategy, this, at least initially, was more conventional. It is important to note that Osama bin Laden regularly invited journalists to interview him. He already spoke with Peter Arnett uh, and Peter Bergen. Uh, this was the interview in which bin Laden reiterated his declaration of jihad against the United States. And when asked about his future plans, declared, you'll see them and hear them in the media, God willing. Author Lawrence Wright noticed Publicity was the currency that Bin Laden was spending, replacing his wealth with fame, and it repaid him with recruits and donations. It was four years after that interview that Al-Qaeda launched its attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. The attack itself was planned as a media event. The intent was to use the media itself to amplify the terrorizing impact. A few months after the attack, Al-Qaeda militants in Pakistan lured Wall Street Journal reporter Danny Pearl into a trap and kidnapped him. Pearl was personally beheaded by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Al-Qaeda's operational leader and the planner of the 9-11 attacks. Al-Qaeda, um, side note, this image of Pearl right here 
holding a newspaper was sent to the Wall Street Journal and other publications via email. Imagine how quickly authorities would be able to track down the Senate today. In response to Pro's kidnapping, CPJ and other groups organized a global media campaign appealing for Pearl's release. His pregnant wife went on television to humanize Pearl. We could not have known at the time, but the strategy played right into Al Qaeda's hands, amplifying the emotional power of his eventual, eventual murder and turning him into Al Qaeda's most famous victim. Bin Laden, who had made a point of cultivating journalists, actually admonished his lieutenant for Pearl's murder, but it was too late. For journalists, it was a game changer. It, was a, it sent a signal to Al-Qaeda affiliates and other jihadi groups around the world that journalists were now fair game, and as a result, we at CPJ saw a huge surge in journalists kidnappings and murders from Somalia to Iraq. It was also a, a reflection of the change in power dynamic spawned by technology. Like other militant and radical groups, Osama bin Laden had talked to journalists because he wanted their audience and it was the utility of the journalists that kept them safe. Now militant groups have a new style of communicating. Pearl's beheading was videotaped, um, and the video was eventually uploaded online, sending a terrorizing message to the organization's foes, and an inspiring one to its followers. The new strategy of using information technology to communicate directly, bypassing the media, continued to be refined over the intervening years, reaching its apogee with the Islamic State in Syria, who produced slick videos amplified on social media. It is worth noting that it's the same strategy employed by the single white nationalist in New Zealand who streamlined on Facebook his massacre of 49 worshippers attending Friday prayers. If September 11th marked an escalation in the risk to journalists from Islamic militants across the world, it also represented a new threat for the states. The war on terror provided the perfect framework for repression, and governments around the world embraced its rhetoric, declaring their political enemies terrorists and criminalizing media coverage of their activities. The Iraq War itself became the most deadly conflict for journalists ever, with at least 150 killed. Journalists feared not only attacks from militants, but from US, mil U.S. military forces. Sixteen journalists were killed by U.S. forces fire in Iraq, and while none of these attacks were ever determined to be deliber deliberate, none were adequately investigated. Journalists found that approaching U.S. checkpoints was an absolutely terrifying experience. Several were shot and killed. U.S. forces also detained a number of journalists, including a prize-winning photographer for the AP named Bilal Hussein. He was held in U.S. custody without charge or explanation for two years. The crackdown on journalists and press freedom has become more or less permanent, as this data indicates. You can see the steady upward tra trajectory following 2001. So, starting right here, up, 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 journalists in person. According to CPJ data, 70% of all journalists jailed around the world are jailed on anti-state charges, mostly anti-terror charges. The term terrorist has been broadly applied to include regime enemies in places like Turkey and Egypt. These two governments are among the world's leading jailer of journalists and the most willing to opportunistically, opportunistically embrace the anti-terror framing. I'll discuss some of the other surges in imprisonment in a moment. Now, if you overlay this graph, the graph of journalists killed around the world during the same period, you see some troubling correspondence. So the, the surge here at the beginning, that's uh, the Bosnian War, in which I mentioned journalists were specifically targeted. Uh, this is the Iraq War, starting in, in here. You can see surges in here. Um, but then that, that was the most deadly conflict ever, and then Syria. Very high number of journalists killed in Syria. Um, and so you can see the trend can, continues. The numbers come down somewhat in recent years, uh, but that's largely because fewer journalists are actually reporting from inside 
uh, Syria, but we've seen a troubling upsurge in these last year in targeted assassination of critical and investigative reporters, and I'm going to discuss this a little later. What is often called disintermediation, the ability of people to bypass media and reach their audience directly using new technologies, weakened the power of journalists and media institutions. But in places where these were loyal to authoritarian states, that process actually had a liberating effect. The most dramatic example is the Tartar Square uprising, which took place in 2011 and led to the downfall of Egypt's Jose Mubarak. Social media technology played a key role in allowing Egyptians to communicate with each other, share grievances, and organize protests. The success of the Tartar Square uprising um, led to the emergence of what could be called internet utopians, who argued that freedom and connectivity were correlated and the internet was uncensorable. While Gonim, who's pictured here, the former Google employee who created a wildly popular Facebook page that helped fuel the Tartar Square protest declared in a moment of wild optimism, if you want to liberate people, give them the internet. Chinese artist and dissident Ai Weiwei declared that if the internet is uncontrollable, freedom will win. It's as simple as that. Inspired by this view, Hillary Clinton and the U.S. State Department declared that they would orient U.S. foreign policy around the promotion of the freedom to connect, a well-intentioned but ultimately disastrous policy that allowed oppressive governments from around the world to portray the internet as a tool of U.S. hegemony and, com and commercial penetration and to revel in the U.S. hypocrisy when it was revealed by Edward Snowden that the U.S. had used its own privileged access to internet technologies not to promote freedom, but to build a surveillance network of unprecedented scope. I'll discuss this more in a moment. Governments around the world, of course, took a different lesson from the success of the Tartar Square uprising in the Arab Spring. They needed to control information in order to survive, and they began to develop sophisticated strategies to achieve this goal. Iran responded the threat of the so-called Green Revolution following the disputed 2009 presidential elections by using social media to reverse engineer the protest movements. A protester who, um, who was arrested was immediately compelled to give up his Facebook password, thus giving the government access to a trove of information that might have been, in other circumstances, attracted through torture. I mean, they could find their friends, their contacts, their likes, their political views. Following the Arab Spring, the mullahs intensified the crackdown. China cracked down hard, following a stillborn protest of the Jasmine movement that, had, that has, China has, in the intervening decade, built a national system of surveillance, monitoring, and censorship, grounded in its control of the country's online technologies and its willingness to build the world's most formidable surveillance state. Russia further repressed independent media, cracked down on online speech, and most importantly, based on an assessment that Western media, backed by governments, were seeking to use information and disinformation to destabilize Russia and its allies, launched an information offensive, which included both overt strategies, RT, which is the Kremlin-funded language, English language broadcaster, and covert, i.e., efforts to influence US elections via Facebook ads, planted stories, and strategic leaks. The internet and press freedom agenda promulgated by the U.S. was thoroughly upended by these two individuals, even though their actions were sparked by different motivations and characterized by different tactics. Edward Snowden, on the right, is the more conventional leaker, in the sense, he has he, in the sense that he provided sensitive and classified information he had obtained to Guardian reporter Glenn Greenwald, and it was the journalist who made the decision about what to publish and what not. Greenwald says he acted responsibly by making public information about the mass surveillance program, uh, making information about the mass surveillance program public, while withholding operational information that could put individuals at risk. While Snowden is held up in Russia and would undoubtedly be prosecuted should he return to the U.S., Greenwald has never faced legal jeopardy. 
Assange is another matter entirely. Because although he fashions himself a journalist, he has behaved in ways that are entirely distinct from any conception of the traditional media. He says he favors radical transparency, and his organization, WikiLeaks, has released raw information which, while shedding light on important political events, has also put individuals in danger. His motivations, particularly surrounding his leaking of Hillary Clinton's emails, are opaque. And he has been accused not only of receiving information from Russian intelligence, but of serving their interests. It looks increasingly like Assange has been indicted in the US under the 1917 Espionage Act, a prosecution that CPJ believes that because of the precedent it would set, would put journalists who work on national security issues at significant legal risk. The combined power of Snowden and Assange was twofold. First, it made clear that the US government, clear to the US government, its vulnerability to massive data leaks, and this in turn sparked a legal crackdown on leakers in this country that has spanned both the Obama and Trump administrations. Second, it made clear that information technology is not just a tool of empowerment and liberation, it is also a tool of surveillance and control, and not just in totalitarian states, but in liberal democracies that were willing to use it for this purpose. So let me use this as a moment to pause and recap. If you look at this moment in time from a historical perspective, we are living through an unprecedented press freedom crisis. Here's the evidence. For the last several years, we've documented record numbers of journalists in prison around the world. These are nearly, these are nearly all local journalists reporting in their own countries. The killing of journalists spiked during the conflicts in Iraq and Syria and has remained high with an increase in targeted assassinations in the last year. New technologies continue to disrupt the systems that keep us informed. We have access to unprecedented amounts of information, and in some instances, this has been a liberating force. But governments are increasingly using the same technologies to create new systems of surveillance, monitoring, and control. Information is being weaponized by states, but also by social forces online that harass and intimidate and ultimately censor other critical voices. The institutional media, while still retaining significant power and influence, is weakened and less committed to international coverage. In general, the US media is more partisan and more polarized. U.S. influence and norm setting on press freedom and human rights has been greatly diminished, and let me take you now through the consequences of that last point. Neither President Bush nor President Obama had perfect press freedom records. In the case of Bush, his broad framework around the war of terror helped fuel a global press freedom crackdown. U.S. forces deployed in Iraq acted recklessly when interacting with civilians, resulting in the deaths of many journalists. Several journalists were detained for long periods of time by the U.S. military. Obama launched a scorched earth campaign against leakers that ensnared many journalists. He implemented and enforced strict protocols regarding the engagement of members of his administration with the media, limiting access to public information. Yet both believed and spoke passionately about the vital role of a free media in a democracy and defended these principles abroad. In the case of Obama, I can point to two examples where this had significant positive consequences. Obama administration officials used Vietnam's desire for better relations with the US to push for the release of bloggers in prison in that country. They leveraged a state visit to Ethiopia to push for the release of a journalist in prison there. Going back to the origins of CPJ, this may have represented the last hurrah for the original advocacy strategy, using the power of the media to push the government, the US government, to take action to defend press freedom. Today, we live in a new paradigm. My entire speech today could have been about Donald Trump. But, I, but instead, I thought it was more important to put what his presidency represents into historical context. 
Trump's contempt for the media is so well documented that I don't think it's necessary to reiterate the way, to reiterate here the ways in which his persistence attacks on the media and his use of fake news and enemies of the press as epithets undermines public confidence in the media. I do it to discredit you all and demean you all so that when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. Trump acknowledged to CBS, of course, CBS News correspondent Leslie Stahl. Sadly, there's evidence that this strategy is working. Besides the threat to American democracy, there is the damage that Trump is doing outside our, countries, our country. While all presidents have lashed out at critical journalists, none before has failed to recognize and uphold their essential function. Trump's anti-media rhetoric is giving solace to dictators and despots who no longer fear pressure from the US and who are in fact mimicking Trump's approach. Remember I pointed out that recent bump in the graph to journalists and Christians around the world, there was, a little, there was a more recent spike? That's partly as a result of the fact that more journalists around the world are being jailed on what are called, we call false news, but are actually fake news charges. In other words, autocratic governments around the world are using fake news charges to imprison their critics. Here are some other recent examples of Trump's corrosive impact. A few days ago, Vladimir Putin signed a new law making it illegal to disrespect the state or spread, quote, fake news online. Egypt has begun implementing a draconian new law criminalizing the publication of fake news online, including potentially devastating fines on anyone with more than 5,000 followers on social media. By the way, no court order is required to impose onerous fines. But the most direct and disturbing message that President Trump has sent about his lack of concern for global press freedom norms has been his response to the murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. Khashoggi, as I'm sure you all know, was strangled and dismembered inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul by a hit squad dispatched from Riyadh, allegedly on the orders of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. CPJ has filed a lawsuit seeking to determine if the U.S. failed to honor Khashoggi of the threat to his life as our government is required to do by law. President Trump has participated in the Saudi cover-up of the, of the crime, making him, and I know this sounds harsh, an accessory after the fact. Despite the findings of the U.S. intelligence community and a resolution from Congress holding the Crown Prince responsible for the Khashoggi murder, Trump released a bizarre White House statement on November 18th in which he proclaimed that U the U.S. commercial and strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia was more important than the life of a single journalist. He also claimed that the Crown, Crown Prince's involvement in the Khashoggi murder was unknowable. In Trump's words, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Exclamation point. This statement underlines U.S. values and influence and sends a deeply disturbing message that the U.S. no longer values press freedom or is willing to defend it. Journalists around the world have gotten the message. Sadly, so too have the dictators. The one positive thing that has come out of Trump's anti-media rhetoric and the Khashoggi murder is an awareness of precisely what's at stake. CPJ has never been more visible or vital. Our mission has received unprecedented public support, and the organization has benefited from a surge in donations. We are using these resources to expand our advocacy in the US around the world, and we are building a coalition of groups and supporters who are collaborating to document press freedom violations, to push back against the president's rhetorical attacks, and to work with Congress and the State Department to orient U.S. policy around press freedom concerns. We are deepening our relationships with European governments, with EU institutions, and the United Nations. We're getting journalists out of jail. We're fighting for justice when they are killed. We are increasing support for journalists under threat by providing safety information and emergency help. We are fighting for the rights of all journalists to report the news freely as they see fit. We are traveling the world to make the case for press freedom. Let me give you an example of our recent work. Venezuela is going through an extraordinary crisis. People lack basic necessities like food, water, electricity. 
They also lack information. CPJ is fighting to keep the people of Venezuela and the world informed. We helped win the release of journals imprisoned and detained in that country, including Jorge Ramos from Univision. We are fighting to make sure the international community stands up for press freedom. We, are, we, have deplo we deployed our emergency director to the Colombia-Venezuela border uh, as part of an effort to make sure journalists have the information they need to do their work safely. We have even helped support journalists who have had to leave the country, ensuring that they are able to continue their work in exile. How can you help us in this effort? Well, this may sound insignificant, but I can assure you that it's not. In the internet age, we're all journalists in the sense that we gather and share information online. You can help us stand up for the press and the rights of journalists by following us on social media and sharing our content. This could not be easier since your Twitter handle is Press Freedom. You can also follow us on Instagram and for all you old folks, there's Facebook. <laughs> Once connected to CPJ, you can help, you, you will be able to help participate in our ongoing campaign to win the release of these two journals. They are Wabo and Wasa Ulu, who were given a seven year prison, prison sentence in reprisal for their reporting on massacres committed against Myanmar's Rikonga, uh, Rikonga Benari. Remember I said we're all journalists? Well, we can all behave like one, I mean, like a good one. When you engage online, make sure you actively seek to determine the reliability of any content you choose to share. Make sure the ideas you express are informed by facts. Be civil when expressing disagreement. If you get something wrong, and we all do, correct it. Our own behavior matters online and sets standards for others. You can fight surveillance by making sure your own data is secure. Please use two-factor authentication. I've been talking to students about this all week. It's really important. Please encrypt your hard drive. Please use complex passwords. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask me. I'll explain it all to you. One last suggestion. Get in the habit of paying for journalism. It costs money to produce. Subscribe to one single media app that you like and you admire. Any for it. Read it every day. Let me tell you about Maria Ressa. She's a journalist in the Philippines. She's the founder and editor of an investigative website called Rapper. She is facing criminal charges and constant harassment from the government and the country's autocratic president, Rodrigo Duterte, in response to her reporting. Her motto is, hold the line. She keeps on reporting day in and day out, and her work informs the people of the Philippines and people all around the world who believe that governments must be accountable and the rights of the people must be respected. Our problems are partially caused by yours, Maria said in a recent speech. American social media technology platforms once in power, now weaponized against journalists, activists, and citizens, spreading lies across border, and a president, so much like ours, who attacks the press and women, gives permission to autocrats like ours to unleash the dark side of humanity and extend their already vast powers of impunity, especially in countries where institutions The central battle of the 21st century is over the control of information. That struggle is not new, but it has intensified as new technologies have upended the information landscape, creating new threats to autocratic systems, which in turn are lashing out using violence and repression. There is also a real risk that the technology itself can be turned against us, used to create a global regime of surveillance and censorship. Defending press freedom begins with recognizing its value and insisting that our democratic leaders stand up for these principles at home and advocate for them abroad. I've made clear today that we are living in perilous times. 
But there are many reasons to be optimistic, including the pushback against Trump's anti-media rhetoric and the response to the Khashoggi murder. Could this be a moment of historic recalibration? Perhaps, but it's up to us to make it so. Thank you very much. Joel, uh, could you talk a little bit about North America and the conditions for journalists? Uh, I've heard that uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists has actually had to uh, expand yeah. its activities uh, here in North America. Yeah. Well, when I started at CPJ, uh, we had uh, what we called our Americas program. And my job was to cover press freedom violations from um, the Yukon to Tierra del Fuego. It was one of feet. And um, I did deal with some cases in the United States. I remember that we had uh, an incident where members of the Russian uh, mafia had like uh, threatened a, a journalist, and I got involved in that. And there were definitely cases that we took up, but they were they were relatively uh, sporadic. Uh, but um, um, last year we, we divided our America's team in two. We created a new North America program. It's actually focused on Canada, the U.S., and uh, Mexico, but a lot of the work uh, is in the U.S. because it was just too much for one person to manage. And we also uh, created a new website, which we call our, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, uh, which is a um, collaborative effort involving a whole uh, variety of different groups. Um, and what we're doing on that website, separate from our main website, is tracking uh, press freedom incidents in the United States because we believe there um, were many incidents that were going unreported. Um, I can tell you some of the things we're looking at that concern us border stops. So we're seeing a lot of journalists crossing the border into the United States, who, um, from Mexico particularly, who uh, are being searched, questions, their devices are being searched. Uh, we're very troubled by that. Uh, there have been a number of uh, subpoenas for journalists uh, around leak investigations. This was a trend uh, that started in the Obama administration, uh, but it's continued under Trump. Uh, we've seen a lot of actually violent attacks, uh, more than we anticipated, particularly against journalists covering demonstrations. Uh, and we've also seen that uh, journalists covering demonstrations are subject to arrest by police because they're taking very aggressive tactics. So there's a whole variety of, of issues. Uh, I should also say, you know, I mean, we, we were, I mean, we're overlooking nearly, of course, the uh, uh, attack on the uh, Capitol Gazette in Maryland, which killed four, four journalists and a media worker, which actually um, there was one of the most deadly attacks in the media in U.S. history. Um, then, uh, of course, there are myriad threats against journalists. Um, we have the um, um, individual who seemed to be inspired by Trump's rhetoric and sent, sent pipe bombs to CNN and others. Um, so it's, it's, you know, and then there's, there's concerns on the part of journalists who are covering um, campaign rallies because um, the kind of rhetoric that Trump originally employs at those rallies and the kind of uh, signaling out of the media and the strong language he uses to criticize them have actually inspired people to behave in a very aggressive manner. Thankfully, uh, we haven't seen uh, anything too serious as a reason yet. But certainly we have, we have concerns. So there's a whole range of new and emerging concerns in the U.S. And um, that's not even to mention the kind of uh, global, you know, the, 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 the um, impact of this kind of overheated rhetoric, which I um, um, cover in my remarks. Hi, uh, my name is Sagan Dagashov, and uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Steinman. Yeah. Uh, while I understand why press freedom in authoritarian states is, is important, don't you think that you're focusing too much on fighting for press freedom and democracies? Because if people in Poland vote for a government that curtails free, uh, freedom of press, maybe they want less freedom of uh, press. And it's uh, not like they're forced to make that choice. They make that choice uh, yeah. freely, you know? Uh, yeah. They're not, they're no dictator in public. But, yeah. Well, that's the, exact, you know, that's the exact same argument that the democratators made, right? It's like, I was elected, um, I therefore have the, the, the will of the people is embodied in me. Who elected the media? No one elected the media, so I'm just going to um, uh, curtail your power, um, and then uh, I will not be held accountable. Uh, you know, there may, be, there may be moments in history when anger at the press reaches such a level that people may think that's a good idea. Uh, but there, there are some structural uh, limitations. One is um, the right to freedom of expression is a, is a fundamental human right. It's guaranteed under international law. 
And so even a government that chooses to restrict it um, uh, under most interpretations of international law uh, wouldn't have the right. That doesn't mean they, don't, they, well, they wouldn't do it, but they don't have, a, they don't have the legal right uh, to restrict uh, and limit this, this fundamental human right. Um, secondly, it creates a system in which there is no possibility of accountability. If the press um, is uh, if the press is suppressed, then uh, there's no way to hold um, uh, leaders accountable. The people don't have information, and people can't make decisions. So, um, so I think I think you end on you, you start on a, on, a, on a downward spiral of repression, and eventually. Uh, you get to the point where you have a single autocratic leader uh, with no um, institutions to rein them in. So um, I think it's a bad idea. Hello, Mr. Simon. My name is Emily. I'm from Central Illinois. Um, so I've been thinking a lot this week about the phrase speak your truth, which has become really popular recently. Okay. Um, and I was wondering like, how you think um, the idea of like truth is kind of like a, an objectively universally applicable concept like influences the way we think about and talk about press freedom. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what, 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 are, what are we defending? What are the, what are the principles uh, under which we defend press freedom? Is it the notion that, 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 that journalists speak the truth um, or have a unique ability to know the truth? Um, no, we're really defending a broad framework in which the fundamental right to express your ideas is safeguarded. And in that environment, um, there is a possibility that the truth will emerge, but there's no guarantee. Um, so we are just, we, we're really fighting to create the fundamental sort of conditions under which critical dialogue can be take place and the truth can be known. But we are not advocating or fighting for the truth itself. I think that's that's the fundamental framework in which those of us who believe in free expression um, operate. Hi, Angie Golan with PolitiFact. I'm going to be on the panel tomorrow. I was wondering with the um, current internet publishing paradigm, do you have problems or challenges defining who is a journalist, who is the press? Yeah. When, can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah, thanks. That's definitely a question that uh, we talked about in my classes this week at Beloit. Um, and uh, yeah, we do have a problem. Uh, it's, it's not easy. Um, and um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have some rigid definition. We've never really had a rigid definition of a process whereby we make these distinctions. And one of the things, one of the benefits of being a, a press freedom organization of being involved in, in, in advocacy is you don't really have to deal with hypotheticals, you're generally dealing with real cases. So an individual was put in jail, an individual was attacked, an individual was censored. And then you have the question is, is that specific individual a journalist and are they engaged in journalism? And let me tell you the way that we answer that question. First of all, uh, because of the structure of CPJ, we have a lot of language facility I and mean, experts who have the, you know, the, the sort of the cultural and political context. And so we read these articles and we kind of think about situating them in the kind of political environment in which, which these articles were written. And then we look at you know, what is the space for, for, for journalistic expression in a, in a particular country if the space and the traditional media is closed, then maybe these kinds of non-traditional expressions um, of, uh, uh, you know, of journalism are actually a form of journalism that we need to defend. Um, and we also look at intent. You know, um, so you know, journalists don't require a license. Uh, journalists don't need. You know, don't need. It's just an, it's essentially an activity that anyone can engage in. And so, if somebody is is actively seeking information with the intention of disseminating that information to the public. We kind of think they're engaged in an act of journalism and should be defended if there are reprisals for that action. You know, the last thing I would say to look for is you know, the level of independence. How independent are they in terms of their ability to uh, make decisions about what information they choose to disseminate? Are they controlled by, it could be some a government, or they're controlled by uh, a political group to which they have an alliance, that makes us 
less likely to consider them a journalist. But there's no magic formula. It's really a process. It's really um, a sort of an exercise in, 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 in journalism itself in terms of reporting and understanding the context and then in, in critical thinking and, and a certain amount of common sense. Andy Hall with the Wisconsin yes. Center for Investigative Journalism. What about uh, the increasing use of freelance journalists uh, reporting in conflict zones um, and, and just in rugged areas um, mm -hmm. around the country or around the world? Yeah. Uh, to what extent does the fact that they're not supported by a news organization in, in many of these cases um, make them more vulnerable um, for uh, repression or for punishment um, by authorities? Yeah, well, um, as, as Beth mentioned in her introduction, I recently wrote a book about um, um, kidnapping and hostage taking. And I focused on the journalists, the journalists who were kidnapped in Syria by the Islamic State. Many of those were freelancers. Um, you know, and, and, and freelancers, you know, as the, um, um, you know, some of the, the, the economic challenges I described compel U.S. media organizations to pull back on their international coverage. In many instances, freelancers stepped into the void. Um, having spent my entire career as a freelancer in Mexico, I definitely understand the mindset of the freelancer mindset and have a natural sympathy uh, for, the, for the vital work that they do. But sometimes the competitive advantages that freelancers have is that there's no one to tell them no. You know, they can take risks that may not be prudent, and sometimes they do, and sometimes those risks um, uh, you know, sometimes there are costs. And then complicating factors further uh, is that when, uh, when things go wrong, they don't usually have a media organization behind them, they don't have the resources that they need um, to do things like you know, get medical attention or get evacuated or deal with the crisis that might come from physical injury or in the worst case of kidnapping. CPJ often steps in and, 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 and does that work wherever we can. Um, I should say that in response to the, the kind of recognition that um, many journalists um, who are covering conflict don't have the same kind of background and support that they might have, been, might have had a generation ago. Also in recognition that much of our conflict, our information that we receive about conflicts around the world is from local journals, not just these freelancers, but local journalists reporting within their own country for the international media. For uh, example, um, um, Afghanistan is a place where, you know, the, 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 all the um, international um, media organizations working in Afghanistan, the journalists who are working for them are, are local Afghans. Um, and um, so recognizing you know, this, this new environment, we created a whole new emergency response team at CPJ, the emergency department, and we hired a safety specialist and we're producing a lot of specialized information um, that helps journalists understand uh, the risks um, and how to, how to mitigate against the risks and it provides a lot of practical information about how to manage information, uh, how to do basic things like prepare a risk assessment, um, how to have an emergency plan, how to acquire proper protective gear, how to have the right insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no question um, that it's a new world uh, when it comes to conflict reporting, the highest risk reporting, um, and that you know, we need to find innovative ways of supporting those journalists, whether they're, whether they're you know, traditional um, international journalists working for large media organizations or freelancers or local reporters working either for the international media or their own national media outlets. Hi, I'm Gabe. Um, I'm just wondering Where about... Where are you, Gabe? Huh? Where are you? <laughs> Okay, um, I'm just wondering about this idea of social media as journalism yeah. and us being young people involved with that. Yeah. Um, and we were talking a little bit about dinner over this idea of journalists being attacked on social media yeah. and how your company, or the CPJ has, yeah. has worked towards um, ways to support journalists in those situations. So I was just wondering as avid uh, social media users ourselves, what are ways that we can support that and support um, journalism in general? Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, the mere, merely using social media doesn't make you a journalist except in some 
broad, abstract way, that journalism can be accomplished on social media using these very simple tools. And there are, there's, there's plenty of individuals who perform what I consider to be um, a journalistic function using, using you know, um, uh, Twitter or, 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 or Facebook or what have you, uh, simply by documenting um, the reality that they observe and, and sharing that information with, with an audience. To me, that's an act of journalism, but obviously, as, as I indicated, um, you know, the mere use of social media uh, is, not, is not necessarily an act of journalism. You know, and so, yeah, well, I mean, what, we, what we're talking about, what we're grappling with, it was a huge challenge for CPJ um, and others who defend free expression, is when people use their right to free expression to stifle other people's free expression. How do we respond to that? So when, um, when, I, when a journalist engages in critical speech and the way in which the enemies of that, uh, or people who disagree with that speech, to silence them is by attacking them relentlessly online. Um, how do we respond? Um, and it's really challenging. We're grappling with this, and we're trying. We're trying to you know, work with, social, with with some of the platforms. We're trying to educate journalists about best practices uh, so that they can insulate themselves from uh, some of these kinds of attacks. Obviously, there are some attacks which are not um, legitimate expression, which are threats of violence, etc. That's not legitimate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just you know, a sort of coordinated criticism that, that is within the parameters of protected speech. Um, so, you know, that is, that is an ongoing challenge for us. But in terms of how others who use social media and want to use it to engage in thoughtful public discourse, I think some of the things that I outlined um, earlier are, are some good practices. Um, one is, um, you know, uh, be thoughtful about what you share and what you say online. Um, don't, um, you know, if you're sharing something or you're saying something, make an effort to make sure that it's true or is the honest belief that it's true sufficient. That's kind of the journalistic standard. You, you can't know the truth, but it, you, you, you make, if you make an honest belief, an honest effort to determine its truthfulness, um, that's uh, sufficient. Um, I think the willingness to you know, correct errors, if you make a mistake, correct it. Uh, be civil, um, uh, engage with people um, online the way you would in real life. I mean, I'm always baffled by uh, how people can have this sort of Jekyll and Hyde personality. They can talk to someone online in a way they never would uh, face to face. Um, you know, I, I don't think um, that that's um, necessarily, necessarily a solution to a hugely complex problem, but I do think that it's important that we model um, our own behavior um, online um, on the way we behave in the real world. Um, and I think that, that just being um, thoughtful and mindful about when we do that can actually, can actually make a difference. So that's what I'd say. So a um, tiny bit of Weisberg history. When Ali Alawi held the Weisberg chair, he remarked that he had more contact with more students in one week at Lloyd College than he experienced in a semester at Harvard. This is a daunting reminder of how much we ask of you, Joel Simon. It is our hopes that once you sleep off the hangover of this week, you will look back nearly as fondly from your perch in Brooklyn as we look back on uh, your time here from our perch in Wisconsin. We hope this week is sufficient for you to allow us to proudly claim you as a voter. Please join me in recognizing and thanking our Weisberg Chair, Joel Simon. <laughs>